it's time to go home. Well, those are the words that are kind of going through Yaakov's mind right now as he leaves Laban behind. He's been in a time of exile, a time in which, I mean, you think back over the couple of decades that he has been uh, away from home and all that's happened. When he left Bethel, that wonderful experience of, of laying his head upon or, or next to that, that pillar, uh, the revelation that he received on that day, only to be taken out into a place of the unknown. He left there saying uh, that when you bring me back to this place and you have uh, given me food and water and you've given me clothing, that uh, I will give you 10% of whatever I have. It's interesting to me, I didn't have a chance to bring this up last week, I don't believe, that when a person, I, maybe I did, I, I have so many teachings that I do now that I can't really, sometimes it's hard for me to remember which program I said what and what I actually said, but I'm going to throw this in, that uh, it, it's just not a difficult thing to give when you've had a revelation. I, I find that those people who have really truly had a revelation of the living Elohim, of the kingdom to come, uh, that makes it a lot easier to open up our wallets and, and to open our checkbooks and to give because why? We're giving to something that has purpose. Uh, rarely do I see someone that's had that kind of a revelation that has a problem with giving. It's, it's those that are, are, are playing, the religious crowd that wants to uh, debate everything. But that's, that's another subject. So we, we see that, you know, for, Lev for, uh, for Yaakov, to have considered what he would go through, uh, he goes to the house of Laban expecting this this holy man, this this man who is uh, his name is White. So uh, he's he's a purit it's purity, and, and instead he sees deception. What does he see in exile? He sees religion. He sees people who say something and then do something totally different. But in the end. He's going to leave that place of exile a little wiser than, than he was when he left. He's going to be coming back with a, uh, a number of children, uh, two wives, two concubines, and a whole lot of stuff that he's, uh, he's trailing behind. He's trailing along there with him, is trailing along there with him. And so it's time to go home. It's time for his exile to be over. But yet, there's a couple things that are standing between him and exile. One of them is his brother. You know, the path to the return from exile uh, is something that I think should probably excite all of us. Uh, consider this, that we're all in exile. You know, it's, it's not just those of us that are... Uh, that are living, living in the United States or South Africa or, or, or Holland or, or Belgium or wherever you may be, Canada. All of us are, are in exile. You can be uh, in, living in Israel, in the old city of Jerusalem, and still be in exile. Why? Because we haven't returned. Exile began um, when Adam and Eve took that first step out of the garden. That's when the exile actually happened. And every exile that has been, has been a, we could call it a sub-exile, to bring us to a, another place of, of restoration, another place of redemption. But there's coming a day, and, you know, just the thought of this brings uh, joy there, there's coming a day in which the exile is going to be over. It's not just going to be the, an exile of the, the ten northern tribes or the exile of, of the southern kingdom from Babylon or the exile of a Yaakov, uh, the exile of a Daniel. It's going to be the total return of the, from the exile. I, I don't know about you. But there is such a longing, and, and I guess it is, it's, it's more this month. Uh, let's face it, we're into the month of December. And uh, though we, you know, 
I have at least, Hanukkah, to, to, to uh, give some sense of normalcy. Though there, there will be, I mean, you go on to, to Facebook, to social media, and the arguments, the fights that, that people are having over all this stuff. I've, I've just really kind of backed off there, during this month uh, from looking at much of anything. Uh, I'll, I'll do a few posts here and there. I'll put my videos up. But for the most part, I just kind of see what the, you know, my notifications are. But I, I don't read very many of them because I don't want to get involved in that garbage. I don't want that stuff to, to, to be a part of my life. I want to put my eyes on going home. That there's going to be a day in which everything is going to be according to this word. Everything is going to be according to the, the plans of Elohim. The, the Torah will go forth from Jerusalem, the word from Mount Zion. There will be peace on earth. Uh, I'm not waiting for a politician. I know that there are many people that uh, last night, yesterday, was the, uh, the, the election runoff between uh, the, the Senate runoff for Georgia. The people that, that this morning got up depressed. Uh, would, would I like to have seen a, a different outcome? Yeah, probably so. But in the end, my hope is not in a politician. My hope is not in some man or woman that is going to all of a sudden arise from somewhere and, and have all the answers. In fact, I'm a little leery of that person that arises and has all the answers and, and uh, wants to put a computer chip in your head for some reason. Uh, just, just saying, you know, think through that one for just a moment. The return of exile. We see in the, uh, the book of Genesis, we're going to be in uh, chapter 32, starting in verse 3 or 4, depending on your translation, a, a, a picture of exile, a return. This is a sub-exile, if we, we can say it like that, of all of these little, little sub-exiles that have been to teach us about what the exile is going to really be like, uh, the, re, the actual return of the ex, from the exile. It's not going to be easy. You know, Yeshua said something. I, I keep thinking about this verse over and over and over again. I've, I've looked at and studied Matthew chapter 24 oh, for uh, almost 40 years, I guess. I've read all, you know, I've read numerous books. I've read Late Great Planet Earth. Uh, I've, I've read prophecy books from back in the days of J.R. Church and... Um, uh, many, many others. But yet, there's something different about seeing those words come to life in front of you. Yeshua talks about a day of, uh, of famine. Can we see that happening? Uh, not just a, a regional famine, but a, a global famine because of all of the, the nonsense that's being done today. Uh, we see of, of wars, yes. No, no matter where you look in the world, there is a, a war that's right on the verge. We're right on the verge. Uh, we, we see China, South Korea, Iran, Syria, Lebanon. It, it's just, it, it seems that everywhere you look, there's something. There's nation rising up against nation today. People don't trust each other. The uh, racism is, I, I grew up in the 70s, and, and I, I know what it's like to, to see firsthand racism in the South. Uh, this is nothing, nothing. That, that was nothing compared to what it, I, I see it as today. Uh, weather patterns. All of these things that are taking place, and Yeshua said that there is coming a day upon this earth they be, will be worse than in any day has ever been, nor ever will be. Are we seeing those days in front of us? I don't know. Maybe yes, maybe no. I, I, I have my opinion, of, of course I do, and I think that most of you would uh, probably know what that opinion is. But we're going to just have to continue to wait and see. And in the process of that, 
prepare ourselves for what the path of return from exile is going to look like. There's going to be some people along the way we're going to have to deal with. There's going to be some events along the way that we're going to have to deal with. First of all is Esau. Now Esau, we know, is Yaakov's brother. Yeshua said that uh, a man's enemies will be those in his own household. Uh, you know, I mean, if I, if I was to go back to, uh, if I was to tell you that like 20 years ago or something, before you knew what the word Torah was, before you knew anything different about, uh, you know, uh, about Christmas ham and all those things. And I would have said to you that you're, you're going to be brought into a path that is going to cause such division in your family that uh, many of them will not even speak to you during a certain time of year. You just say, oh, no, 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 no that, that could never be. But yet, what's happening? But this is just a probably a precursor because we're going to, in the return, the path of return from exile, we're going to be brought face to face with those who are against the covenant. And this, in the end, is what and who Esau is. He is a man who has come face to face with the covenant and has rejected it. You know, that's probably the most difficult thing to me during this time of, of December. I just, uh, sometimes I, I just would like to kind of wipe this month off of the, the, the calendar. Let's get to January and let's just kind of take another run at it. Because it, it seems that for so many people, and this is, this is true, not only for those that are involved in, in the holidays, and, and, uh, it, but for, for Messianic Hebrew root circles, for everybody. It, it seems like December becomes this month that is, is useless in many ways. That people just disconnect. Uh, it, it, there'll be, you know, it, it's like... Priorities, I guess that would be the, the best way to put it. Priorities just get put out of, out of whack here. They, they just become nonsense at times. That What people believe they need to do versus what they probably really should do. And what they probably should be doing is coming face to face with the Esau's of their life of that which is holding us back from the covenant. But you know, in, this, in this, this account of Esau and Yaakov, there is one word <clears throat> that, uh, that, that stands out in this whole story to me. And it's a, it's a, story, it's a, a word that I have underlined, uh, a word that is in, and again, there's differences in verses here. It's 20 or 21, depending on your, your translation. And it says, and, and there just behind us is your servant Yaakov. For he said, I will appease him first with the present that goes ahead of me. Then after that, I will see him myself. The, the word here that I'd like to, to consider for a moment is the word appease. Now, in Hebrew, it's... The, the connotations of this word are, are kind of, you know, we look at the word appease, what does that actually mean? Well, of course, Hebrew has a more concrete meaning to it, <clears throat> and it is the word kafar. Now, where would we find, first of all, first instance in Scripture, the, the place of kafar, the word kafar? It would be in the ark. So here is a reference for us that as in the days of Noah, if you want a great study, continue to study what happened around that time period of what we do know today, and there will be things about Noah's life that will come up along the way in this time that Yeshua spoke about, which will be our time of the path of return from exile. So the word kafar is that he put pitch 
upon the ark on the, both the inside and the outside. He literally covered the ark. And so what is this telling us regarding Esau and Jacob? That Jacob is, instead of dealing with the situation, I know this sounds a little judgmental, uh, and I'm, I'm not one to throw stones at these people, but just to, to bring out some what I see as truth, that instead of dealing with Esau, he does something to cover up. He kind of wants to, to, to appease, to cover it over, to make it look like it's okay when, in fact, it's not okay. If you take a piece of, of wood, <clears throat> a piece of wood that's rotted. I have uh, a, a deck that's in, in need of some, some boards on it right now because some of them, I, I have to, I put little pieces of wood on top so that you don't step through it. Uh, but at the price of lumber these days, I've just kind of covered it up. I've covered over it. I, I tried, first of all, to put some paint over it. And, hey, it looked good for a little while. But, you know, you step on a rotten board that has paint on it. And what do you find out? That you're going to, uh, you're, you're still going to fall through it. It's going to look better as you do. But you're still going to fall over or fall through. Why? Because instead of fixing the problem, you just, I know this is not actually a word it is now though, because I'm, I'm using it, you just cafard it, okay? You just covered it over. Yeshua speaks in, uh, in Matthew, uh, in the, the infamous uh, Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the peacemakers. Notice that he did not say the peacekeepers. Now, as a, a, as a person who does not like confrontation, and that's me, um, I, I, I grew up with way too much confrontation in, in, in our house as a very young child, and uh, to this day, I do not like confrontation. But, with that being said, I, I continue to find that there are times that I must confront we must confront issues. We must confront people. Um, because a, the difference between a peacemaker and a peacekeeper is that a peacemaker actually makes peace. Bring two people, two entities, two somethings together and say, we're going to come to a place of reconciling these problems. Whereas a peace keeper can come up with a false piece but it will not be lasting i uh, i think that the best description for a peace keeper is they become a doormat for other people everyone knows that the problem is there it's never resolved but we just don't talk about it anymore and therefore if we don't talk about it it's really not happening and uh, maybe it'll just go away on its own. Well, how many times has that happened that it doesn't? That's what's going on here. In our return from exile, I believe the Almighty is going to bring us face to face. And he does here in, uh, as we go on in this chapter, this time in which Yaakov is by himself. He, he got up that night, took his two wives, his two slave girls, his 11 children and forded the, uh, the Yabak. And, we, and it says that he was left alone. Then some men wrestled with him until daybreak. Now, there's all kinds of discussion on who this man is. Of course, in Christian circles, every time we, we see, th it's got to be Messiah. So he was wrestling with Messiah. Eh, well, okay, I, I, I think we can make some arguments here. Uh, there are those that believe that he was wrestling with the spirit of, of Esau. Uh, we could make some arguments there. He was wrestling with himself. Well, we could make some arguments there. In the end, I do not believe it's important for us to know specifically who he was wrestling with. What is important is for us to understand 
that he wrestled until he prevailed. That no matter what it is in our lives, maybe there's some things, and, and I, I mean, I know that none of you would do this, that you've wrestled with God at times. That he's trying to move you in a direction, as he does me. And it's like, we are got to have a little wrestling match over this one. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. It sounds stupid. But how many of us do it anyway? You know, I mean, I know who's going to win, or I know who I want to win, but it's just this thing that we do. Uh, do we wrestle with the enemy? Of course, we wrestle with, uh, with, with principalities, with powers. It's just what life is. To deny that these, that these entities are around us, that these entities are invading this world today uh, is, is naive at best. And then there's that wrestling with ourselves. And maybe that one is the, sometimes is the most difficult. The most difficult one to overcome. Even Rav Shaul would talk about this and say, you know, that which I, I want to do, I I don't do, and that which I don't want to do, I, I find myself doing, and oh, wretched man that I am. Who will save me from this? It's only when we bring the, redemp the redemptive power of Messiah into the picture that at that point, he wins the battle. He wins that match, and, and that in the end is what we should all be desiring. So it says that, we're not told specifically who. I, I'm, I'm okay with that. You can put it in whoever you want, but here's, here's, the, here's the point. That in the end, Yaakov says, this match is not going to be over until you bless me. Now, that word Baruch is, uh, is a little bit different, can have a little different connotation here. The word Baruch or bless is to kneel down. So until you kneel down to me, until you give unto me that which I am needing, let's, let's put it that way, until you give to me that which I am needing to move forward from this place, I'm not leaving here. I think that probably many of us uh, know that we need to come to those places of wrestling with things and saying, I'm not leaving it here until this work is done. Until whatever it is, whether it is, uh, whether it is myself, whether it is a spiritual principality or power, I need to kneel down. I need, I need that to kneel down to the power and work that the Father desires to do with me. And therefore, in, in, in the midst of this, what do we see? We see that Yaakov is now named Israel. We, you know, where is the birth of Israel? It's right here. We see this, this place that Yaakov's name is changed from Yaakov to uh, the, the word Israel. Some have, uh, have translated, translated as, as uh, Prince of El. But it literally means one who has prevailed with El. So consider this, that to be in Israel, and I'm not talking about the, the land specifically right now, I'm talking about the people called Israel, is a, is a, a person or a people group who have prevailed over their L's with a small e and made them kneel down to the God, to the L, the Elohim with the large E. We know from scripture there are, there are many gods in this world. People make themselves God. They, uh, you can make materialism God. You can make politics God. You can make religion God. But all of those gods with a little g, 
must in the end kneel down so that we prevail over them and serve only the Elohim with the large E, the God with the large G. Hope that makes some sense to you. He came to a place of an encounter. And this is where um, Yaakov goes over and over again in his life, and I think it's very important. I uh, taught a message this past Shabbat. In fact, uh, it is online. You can order this one for our partners, those that support us. Uh, that's the, the message could be sent out, MP3, CD, whichever one you prefer. If uh, you would like a copy of that, all you have to do is go to our website. You can order it. Uh, we, we appreciate, I appreciate it. We appreciate it when you, uh, you donate for that. That's how our ministry is actually funded. But, uh, you know, if you just would like the message, all you have to do is send me an email. I'll send you a link. Uh, no strings attached, free of charge. My blessing unto you. But the, the point of the message, and the, the message is named, An Encounter with a Revelation. Yaakov is a man who, the same as his father Isaac, his grandfather Avraham, uh, one that would be his descendant Moses, the prophets, the disciples, they had an encounter with a revelation that changed, defined, not changed, but defined their lives. I still see to this day so many people that go to service week after week, go through all the motions. I'm not speaking about anybody specific. I, I'm, I, I travel all over. I'll actually be in Blue Ridge in a couple of weeks uh, for a young adult meeting there. Conferences that I do, uh, things that I'm a part of. I see so many people that are just going because of whatever, because of duty, because of, uh, of social interaction, but not encountering the living Elohim. Folks, if there's anything that we need in our day, it is, it's, it's not more learning. It, it's not more study. Though, we sh yes, we should study to show ourselves approved, but why are you studying? Are you studying just so that you can prove your, your lifestyle is right and somebody else's is wrong? Or is it an encounter? You know, the disciples that said of them that these were a, a men of, they were unlearned and untrained. But they had been with Yeshua. And because of this, they were able to turn the world upside down or in fact turn it right side up. It is not our learning that will change lives. It is not our study, our wonderful study that will change lives. It's not our, our, our knowledge of Hebrew and Greek and Latin and whatever, and pig Latin. It's not our knowledge of all those things. It is an encounter with a living Elohim that will affect not only our lives, but other people's lives. Now, from this point on in Scripture, we see a very interesting little clue that though Jacob, now Israel, has had this encounter with Esau, he had an encounter with at the at, at Bethel. He still is operating kind of as a, a, a dual personality at times. We're going to see that. When his name his, his name sometimes will be used as Israel, and at other times his name will be Jacob. Uh, one of the, the the best instances of that is when he uh, gives the the words unto his boys that you know come together. And uh, let me just go over real quick and and read those those words because it's uh, it says gather together, and this is in uh, chapter twenty nine verse one. Uh, then Yaakov called for his sons and said, Gather together yourselves together, and I will tell you what will happen to you in the last days. Assemble yourselves and listen, sons of Yaakov, pay attention to Israel, your father. So we're going to see a clue into this man's life 
of which side is he walking in? And, and we all know that there's, there's times that we walk out a life that is in line with the patterns and direction and conviction of the Almighty himself, and there's times we blow it. And, and Jacob, Israel, is going to be no different. We're going to continue to wrestle. As long as we're on this path of return from exile, we're going to continue the wrestling match. Sometimes we're going to win. Sometimes we're not. Sometimes we're going to be victorious. Sometimes we're going to fall on our face. But we're going to continue to get up and continue to move forward until we get to that place of that, what I, I, I think that the greatest thing to me about whatever that resurrected body thing is, and I know that you know we've we've all people have always have, have written so much about this, and to to me it's not the the you know as you get older you start longing longing a little bit more for that resurrected body because of the pain. Uh, and, and, and things that happen, and diseases, and all kinds of stuff, and you, you know, you feel like you're you're needing to go to the to the uh, the spare parts counter somewhere. That's not the big thing to me. It's the the wrestling match with myself will be over. The the resurrected body will have a resurrected mind, will have a resurrected being that will no longer be wrestling with the things of this world, the things that are against the covenant, that wrestling match will be over. Being able to serve him for the first time, 100%, totally, completely, everything given over to him, nothing being held back, not, never making a wrong decision, in our service to him. That, that is the beauty of that resurrected being that we're going to be. So Jacob makes a stop. It's a disaster. Have you ever been traveling as, I mean, I've traveled for extensively for many years and you're, you're looking down at the gas gauge and you know, it's getting a little bit lower than you're comfortable with, and uh, maybe the kids need a, a bathroom break, and, and you're needing uh, one, and you, you just want to stretch your legs and something, and you, okay, there's a rest stop right there, there's, a, there's an exit right there, and let's just get off on this exit. And you get off on that exit, and you're looking around at the environment that you've pulled off into, and you think to yourself, I don't think I should be here. I've done that numerous times. I've done that a couple of times that still stick out in my mind. That uh, I let that gas gauge go down way too far to where I didn't have any choice. And I had to stop somewhere. And it's like, I'm just wanting to get enough gas in my vehicle to get me out of here. And this is not a, uh, this has nothing to do with, with race or any of those things. It's just, there's places in this world that I would rather not be. Um, we've all probably been there. For Jacob, why does he stop? You ever ask that question? Why does he stop? He has made this vow that at Bethel, if you, when you lead me from this place and you provide for me bread and water and clothing and, and shoes, that I will come back to here. Well, he is walking, literally retracing his steps. The steps that happened a couple of decades ago. He's tracing the same steps that Abraham walked. He's tracing the same steps that the uh, that, that Isaac's servant, or, or that Abraham's servant went. He's tracing the same steps that uh, that his mother walked. 
This is familiar territory. Why does he stop here? Why, why is it that he doesn't just continue on? This rest stop, instead of an urgency to go to Beit El, instead of looking and, and saying, guys, I know that you're tired. I know that you need a potty break. But we have a destination. And I, you just need to, to hold it for another stop or two, and we will make it there. In fact, we'll, we'll kind of push this a little bit if we need to. But I have an appointment that I've been waiting over two decades for, and we're not pulling off on this, this exit right now. We're pushing through to the destination because, if I'm right in this, because the destination was not an urgency in Yaakov, it caused him to stop and to camp out at a place called Shkem. We know that today is modern-day Nablus, a place that has so much prophetic meaning, the, the place that's between the, the Mount Gerizim, Mount Ival. He stops there not just for a, a rest stop, but like for a multiple night stay. He stays there long enough that his family gets to know the inhabitants of Shechem. It, it, it's kind of like, to me, um, you know, Lot going to Sodom and Gomorrah, why, why are you staying there? You know that this is not a place that you should be. Now, we see that his daughter... Um, Dinah ends up getting in some trouble there. And it causes just event after event after event to happen in, in, in the life of Yaakov and his family to the point of Shimon, Levi, you know, you guys, you've, you've, you've read the story many times of, you know, we're going to circumcise everybody and then they, then they kill everybody. Uh, this event didn't have to happen. This is another one of those chapters in Scripture that doesn't have to be. I don't think we any of us need to point our fingers, though. For how many chapters of our lives, how many chapters of my life, do I, do I look back and say, that chapter didn't have to be. If only I'd have been more urgent in the destination. I think that today, the best thing that we can have to, to bring us through this, all the things that are going on, is an urgency for the kingdom. An urgency for our destination. Because it will cause us to bypass exits along the way that we shouldn't had to we shouldn't have stopped at to begin with in this the the end verse here is as is you know uh, Yaakov says to to Shimon and uh, Simon and Levi what have you done why have you done this and the the last verse is they replied should we let our sister be treated like a, a whore, a prostitute. And there's no answer. Why? Because Yaakov still has this side of himself that's appeasing. Now, is, did Simeon and Levi do the right thing? Well, I mean, they're scattered into the tribes. It turned out a little bit better for Levi than it did for, did for Simeon. Discussion after discussion can be made about this. There's things that we, we, we can't really answer here of who's right, who's wrong. The, the point is this, that if Yaakov would have had an urgency for his destination, none of this would have happened. May we have an urgency 
for the destination that is before us, which is the kingdom. Now, chapter 35 is Elohim says to Yaakov, get up, go to Bethel. all right? Let's put this thing, get back on the road, man. Let's get on there. But you got to do some things before you do this. And the, number one is put away the false gods, your foreign gods, your strange gods. Excuse me, why are these here? It says that they, they, uh, they buried them under a pistachio tree near Shkem. I mean, my, my thought is this. Why are they there? Why, do you, why are you carrying them? Is this not weighting you down? See, foreign gods, strange gods, pagan practices will weight you down upon your journey. It will cause you. Uh, I've, I've done enough, Kathy and I have done enough backpacking along the way that, you know, the first couple of times that you go backpacking, you find out that you carry a lot of stuff that you never needed to carry. And as you get more, as your training gets better at backpacking, you figure out what you can leave behind because you didn't need it in the first place. Survival teachers will do this, make you lay everything out and then leave most of it behind because you really don't need it. Foreign gods, pagan practices, and just things that don't need to be in our lives need to be left behind. Now, for Rachel, it's possible that she refused. Who's the one that has... I mean, who's the queen of the foreign gods here? She's the one that took them from her father, Laban. Is it possible that the reason that she died along the way is because she refused to give up? What's a, what's a pagan god? It's plan B. It is, it's a lack of faith, a lack of trust. Did And this is, again, speculation, but is, is it possible that that uh, that Rachel didn't truly trust her husband? And because of that, she had like, well, if this doesn't work out, you know, I mean, I, I've, I've heard a lot about this guy and I've heard a lot about the place we're going, but in case it doesn't work out, I've got plan B. And she never totally put her faith and trust in her husband. Are we doing the same thing today? in not truly putting our faith and trust. Still trying to appease. You know, here we are in December. I grieve over this month. I don't, I don't get mad. I mean, I, I get more mad at, at, at somebody standing behind a, a piece of plexiglass with a mask and, and, and you know, in a, in a face shield and a respirator and all those kind of things hooked up to them. I, that, that aggravates me. I don't, I don't get mad when I go into Walmart. I don't get mad when I go into uh, to, to these different... I, it grieves me. It grieves me to see people that are weighted down with traditions... I'm not going to. I'm not going to call them pagans. My my grandmother uh, put up a, a tree, made a Christmas ham. She wasn't a pagan. She didn't have an understanding. So why should I call somebody a name, a derogatory name, when they're just walking in the practices that they they they, they think they understand? That they're doing what they were taught. It's not going to help for me to get mad at them, but maybe it will help if I show life, and that's the hardest thing during this month, is walking through this month, to me at least, is to walk through it with life. I know we got Hanukkah in the middle of it, yeah, but for, for most people, they just look at Hanukkah as a, as a kind of a Christmas alternative. And for many people, that's what it is. You know, let's give the kids presents for eight days. Uh, that'll, that'll satisfy it. It's, it's still the same spirit, guys. We can't just replace 
one thing that's wrong with something that may be right, but we turn it into something wrong. I hope that makes sense. Somebody asked me the other uh, recently, you know, would it be wrong to to go and, and get a tree and you know and decorate it? I can't answer that for someone else. I I mean I can open the scripture and I can go to Jeremiah and uh, you know I, I think I can open history books and and, and see and, and pretty much prove factually that all of these things that are around this month come from uh, basically from pagan practices that have been adopted. Okay, I, I can prove that. But, you know, facts don't change people's minds. It's interesting. Facts don't change people's minds. Most people do what they do in life not based upon fact, but based upon emotion. I'm not going to, to, to call someone pagan for what they're doing. I, I will try to explain that maybe they need to look at things from a different aspect. Maybe they need to research what they're doing. To do these things is wrong for me. To be a part of that which is happening in the month of December is wrong for me. And I have to make a stand. I can't appease it. I can't make, I, I can't just keep the peace just for the sake of keeping the peace. I have to live my life based upon the convictions that have been given to me. But with that being said, what truly grieves me in this month is that those who say that Messiah is the reason for the season, show it to me. Show me. Take me in some store. Take me to someone's yard. They've got a little sign over here that says, you know, Jesus is the reason for the season. Kind of like they got the, the little sign that says, protected by ADT. But when you have these huge inflatables and, and decorations all over the place with, with everything except some reference to the Messiah, tell me how that little sign over in the corner of the yard makes me focus on the sign instead of all this other stuff. Show me where he is in this season and I'll be glad to celebrate whatever but he's not in this season he's been pushed out yes there were there have been people through the years that, that have celebrated and, okay I got that but look at what it's turned into look at it's maybe it's turned into what it was in the first place maybe that's the problem I need, I must make a conscious decision of conviction. I can't pull off the road at these rest stops. Why? Because there's an urgency. There's an urgency for my destination. And my destination drives, no, no pun intended there, my destination drives what I do along the journey. May it be that, that, that way for all of us. I've been a little disjointed today. Uh, a lot, this, this Torah portion is one that I just, there's things in here that it's like, no, no, no. And then I, you know, I, I look at my own life sometimes and go, no, no, no. And uh, maybe that's what bothers me is, is when I'm reading it. So... Shabbat Shalom, Shavua Tov, have a blessed, prosperous week. Bezrat Hashem, God willing, I'll be more in line next week with something. Until then, be strong. Yibarecha
ya'er Adonai panav elecha v'yichunecha. Yisa Adonai panav elecha v'yasem lecha Shalom.